How's it going, Internet? This is Jeremiah, and I'm back to analyze another one of my chess games for you. Uh, this game was played in a live tournament over the board probably a few months ago. Uh, I was rated 1,600. My opponent was rated 1,800, so he was higher rated than me. It was round three of the tournament. Uh, there were four rounds, and I was really looking to win. So here we go. I open the game with e4. I love playing e4. As Bobby Fischer famously said, e4 is best by test. My higher rated opponent plays c5, the Sicilian defense. This is what black will usually play when they want to win. And my opponent being higher rated than me, for sure he wanted to win. In my last video, uh, I don't know if you remember me telling you that playing the Sicilian defense for black can be tricky because if you don't know all the variations, then it could uh, really backfire on you quickly, as this game will illustrate. So I follow up in typical fashion, knight f3. Opponent plays d6, and I go for the open Sicilian by playing d4, opening up the center. He takes with the c-pawn. I take back with the knight. He plays knight f6. I play knight c3. And my opponent plays a6, the Nidorf variation of the Sicilian defense. This is the this opening has been called the Cadillac of chess openings. Grandmasters play this all the time. Uh, it was really popular back in the 80s and the 90s. I know Kasparov, Gary Kasparov, played this a lot during his World Championship matches, and a lot of grandmasters will play this today. Maybe not at the highest levels because it's been analyzed and played so often that it doesn't have the same bite that it once did but you know it'll you'll still see this at every level of chess so the main line or maybe not the main line but the sharpest variation here uh, for white is to play bishop here and then black will do something like this and this is very well-known theory in the Nidorf Sicilian uh, it's very sharp Everybody's attacking. I was pretty sure my opponent would know this variation, though, because everybody plays it. So speaking of Gary Kasparov, uh, one thing that I saw him do a lot back in his games, and I've seen the current world champion Magnus Carlsen do the same thing, is play this G3 variation, the Zagreb variation. Uh, I think Nidor players don't want to see this. It gets them out of their theory really quick, and it still has some bite to it, for white. So I, I like to play this, especially against higher rated players, because I don't think they're really going to see it coming. Uh, I know the main continuation for this for black is to play e5 here and kick this knight back. But then white has ideas of Fianchettoing his bishop here. Then he plays knight here, knight here, castles, you know, maybe put the bishop out here somewhere and then start advancing his pawns like this on the queen side in some fashion. I know this is the general plan for white in this variation. Uh, black does not do that. Black just plays e6, which is passive. It's also it, it's also the right move that I showed you before. Like if, if I put the bishop here, yeah, e6, great move. But now, uh, I don't really see what you're doing here. He's blocking his bishop. Bishop can't get out. This bishop can't get out. You know, this knight this knight could get out, but I don't know. And then the if he castles kingside, which is exactly what I want, then he runs into all sorts of trouble with my pawns coming at him like this. So I don't agree with e6 as this move here. It's probably not that bad. I don't think the computer says it's that bad. But I just don't think it's uh, objectively the best move. So I fianchetto my bishop, bishop e7, and now I play here. Um, I think this is where I start going wrong a little bit in this variation, this bishop going here. Maybe he would have been better like on this square or this square. Playing the bishop here to e3 like this is a common idea in other Sicilian defenses, you know, where, as you'll see later, White puts his his queen here, castles queenside, and then just comes in an all-out attack on the king side. 
I, I, I don't think it's very thematic in the variation, the Zagreb variation that I picked. But because he was playing this way, I figured, you know, why not keep my plans flexible? You know, I could either I could either go with my Zagreb plan, or I could go with this. I, I just wanted to stay flexible. I didn't think it was that bad, and I don't, and I don't think the computer does either. But again, objectively and strategically, mm, this move is questionable. So we castles. Now Queen D two is a bit of a mistake for me. I'll admit that. I'm really not sure why I did this. I think I was just going ahead with my plan. Because what black can do here, what black's best continuation is, and again, you'll see this a lot in these types of Sicilian defenses. So he'll play here, throwing a punch at my bishop. There's really nothing I can do. This bishop's goner. He's going to get it. I can't, I can't move it anywhere. And in these Sicilian defenses, you want this bishop because this bishop's attacking. Lots of stuff going on. So I don't know. I don't know what I was thinking. Uh, the computer offers some continuations like this. The knight takes. Queen takes. And you can see that, you know, white is down the bishop pair. Black has a better structure. I mean, I do have a development lead because these pieces aren't going anywhere or haven't moved yet. But, you know, black having the two bishops. Yeah, I think the computer says that black is slightly better in this position, something like 0.4 or 0.5. Certainly not game losing, but not in the spirit of a Sicilian defense for white. So uh, fortunately, that's, you know, that's not really what he did. That's not how he played. After I played queen d2, he just plays e5 now, which is, you know, if you're going to play e5, why didn't you play that earlier? Why play e6, then e5, and waste a turn? You know, so my knight comes in, knife f5, as uh, my hero Grandmaster Ben Feingold says. Uh, I don't mind if he takes it with this bishop because this is his good bishop. It's really his only bishop. Like, you'll see that this bishop here doesn't have any moves. He's just stuck. His own pieces are, are trapped. So if, if he takes this bishop, or if he takes this knight, rather, you know, I capture back, and he's got some issues. He's got some issues to work out. And this is kind of the thing in the Sicilian defense, is if black doesn't make the right move all the time, the posi his position just crumbles as you'll see in a moment. Uh, so he, he didn't take the knight. He plays bishop e6, uh, I suppose. I suppose this is a move. But this pawn is now very weak. You know, it's, it's being attacked twice. It's only being defended twice. He's going to have kind of an issue getting some support here for this pawn. Again, very common and very thematic in almost any Sicilian defense is this pawn becomes an issue. So I castle, most aggressive castle to the queen side. Uh, now there's three attackers on this pawn, and how do you defend? Not really sure how he defends. Plays b5. Yeah, you know, this, this is a good idea in most Sicilian defenses for black, because eventually, you know, your knight should be out here already. Eventually you want to bring your rook here, sacrifice it for this or for this uh, knight and then just start your attack but black hasn't played his knight out here yet his rook really can't come over and again this pawn's weak so b5 here I think is a mistake eh, maybe you call it a blunder too I don't know it could be considered a blunder but yeah now after a simple tactical sequence knight takes bishop check queen takes Queen takes pawn, queen takes queen, rook takes queen. Now I'm up a pawn. I've got a, a rook here on the open file, which is where I want it. This bishop is pretty good. You know, this bishop over here, this, this guy, he's a little questionable. You know, he's staring here at this. Can't really go anywhere, but he's a good defender and a good protector, and I like him there. You know, he's, he's, he's watching out for this square. 
Yeah. You know, and eventually I have plans to go like this, double up on the bubble up, and then just come get him. So I'm a, I'm a pawn. I'm doing good. I'm happy here. Still certainly not winning by this point, but it's pretty close. You know, when you're up a pawn in this type of structure, you're doing pretty good. Black still has some bite left to him, maybe. If I blunder or if I make a mistake or if he just comes at me and attacks relentlessly, I could I could slip. Which is kind of what he does, but uh, let's go ahead and finish. We'll see what happens. Very aggressive. B4. He wants to come get me. Um, I have th this move, you know, you want your, you want your minor pieces in the center of the board, especially knights, because your knight is coming after all these squares, you know, I mean, look at all that. You want your knights and your, and your queens and your bishops in the center because they're going to control more squares. So to me, this is just a natural move, you know, knight e5. It's kind of what you want to do in the Zagreb variation anyway. But I think the computer, I think during when I was doing my own home analysis, the computer wants you to play here. Maybe with ideas of coming in. Attacking the rook. You know, putting your knight on the rim is no, it's generally not a good idea. So this is why I didn't, I didn't play this knight to here. Looks like a computer move to me. And it is a computer move. So I just played knight d5, put him in the center. It's where you want your knights to be anyway. This is a human move. Uh, he comes out, finally, with his knight. <laughs> what is this, move 15 and his knight is moving? His knight it, his knight should have been out way earlier than this. Way earlier. I take. When you're up ahead, uh, when you're ahead of material in chess, even if it's just a pawn, it's a good idea to trade pieces away. You know, make the game less complicated get to an end game, and then win. So uh, conversely, if you're down in material, you want to keep as many pieces on the board as possible. So black shouldn't be inviting trades here, which he kind of does. Yeah. I like this move because it stops this bishop from coming in. You know, he probably has ideas about going like this ripping open the a-file and then maybe checkmating me somehow here on the back rank maybe <laughs> so my pawn to b3 move pretty much stops all that stops all that nonsense yeah here here it comes he wants to rip open the a-file uh, i double up my rooks always a good strategic idea yeah here he comes like he's desperate now something that uh I think any player, well, maybe not any player, but I think anybody rated under 2,000, when they realize that they're down a pawn or down a piece for two pawns or something like that, they want to make the game crazy. Like, they want to, they just want to make it as weird and as tactical and as attacking as they possibly can instead of just playing solid and trying to play for a draw. If he had tried to play for a draw here, I'm pretty sure he would have gotten it. Not 100% sure, but pretty sure. But here, yeah, my opponent, I could see in his eyes over the board that he was just like, oh, no, I can't lose to this lower-rated player. i got to come get him. So you got to respect that. Uh, King b2, which is a good move, I think. You know, there's no way that he's getting at this king now. No way. He doesn't have a bishop that can attack. His knight can't come in and attack. And if he decides to do something like this, then I just go back. Queen side's locked up. He's got nothing. Vishwa, nothing. King b2. He wants to take. Yeah. Again, I, I expected this. You know, he thought he thought for like five minutes or so before playing this move, and I already expected it. And the question is, which way do I take, right? Do I take with this pawn or do I take with this pawn? I don't like taking with the a pawn because, again, it opens up the a file and potentially gives him ideas of you know doubling up his rooks he wants to bring a rook over here then bring another rook down down into this area you know his bishop is still pretty good here 
And you know when all those arrows are, are looking like that, that it could be kind of dangerous. So I was thinking to myself, well, if I'm not taking with the A-pawn, take with the C-pawn. Keeping this, this structure locked up and nice. He can't come in. My king's on a great square that can't be attacked. Yeah, and from this point on, I just think he uh, he gave up. Maybe not gave up, but he realized that, uh-oh, you know, I'm not getting anywhere. I'm not going to not gonna be able to beat him. So he just started playing this these odd, odd, odd moves that I don't understand. You know, rook a5. I mean, I understand it. He wants, he wants to come over and double up. I understand it. But it's, you know, these threats are easily parried. Like this, bishop b6. He doesn't have time to get the rook over here. I'm attacking his rook. And if I take if I take even one more pawn or one more piece, he can resign. This position right here maybe isn't a resignable position, but yeah, it's getting close. So I attack his rook. He tries to get sneaky by you know counterattacking on my bishop. Always play bishop f1, another grandmaster Ben Feingold rule. And now, yeah, your rook's trapped. Black. I don't see where your rook's going. There's no squares. You could sacrifice an exchange and maybe, maybe hope for something, but yeah, nothing's happening. So he tries this, this little sneaky trick, you know, I suppose, but it's not even really a trick because again through a simple tactical sequence of rook takes i'm sorry bishop takes rook knight takes rook rook takes knight and now i'm up a piece i've got the two bishops my king is perfectly safe these pawns over here can never be attacked by his bishop because they're on dark squares yeah this this is a resignable position he could just resign here he plays. He decides to play on a little bit, though. You know, whatever. I guess he's thinking that there's there's a pin here. Like I can't move the bishop because then he just takes the bishop behind it. But yeah, now rook d8 check, and he's losing his rook. I've got the two bishops. I've got control of the dark squares. Uh, my pawns are better. Uh, this is just totally winning, and he, uh, my opponent resigned. At this point so I think I, uh, I finished that tournament again it was four rounds this was round three I finished with two wins this one included a draw and a loss so even with that it was still only like second or third place but that's not bad I don't think it's bad and this was a, a great game for me to I think this was like my second live tournament that I'd ever played in maybe the third uh, and there's just something to be said about winning a chess game uh, in a live setting with your opponent sitting across from you and your opponent is better than you, in theory. Yeah, after this game was after he resigned, he shook my hand and uh, looked me in the eye and he was like, good game. And I was like, thank you. And I felt really, really good after this. You know, if, if I had, I think if I had won the last round of that tournament, then I would have won the tournament. But I ended up losing. The guy, the my next opponent was rated 2200. You know, he was pretty close to a master. So I didn't feel so bad about that loss. But this game was pretty instructive for me. You know, it teaches you about if you're going to play the Sicilian defense, yeah, you got to be uh, you got to be up to date on all the variations. And again, my opponent plays the Nidorf, with which is a very theoretical, very very uh, common opening even on the highest levels and yeah he just wasn't prepared for this for this g3 variation you know he he wanted to attack he wanted to come get me and i wasn't gonna have that i was gonna outplay him and slowly move my pieces around until he went to sleep and then win and that's exactly what happened so anyway uh that's my second chess video uh, hopefully my analysis here is getting better I hope everybody's having a great day, and I'll see you in the future. Bye-bye.